Well, brazen attacks against truth, growing spiritual warfare, and the oppressive agenda behind it all. Jack Hibbs, Lee Cummings, and Russell Johnson take on today's toughest topics and what the church needs to know. If you're enjoying Table Talk, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Remember to click that notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest posts. Are we actually in a recession? Economic pessimism, it is still very much there. The Supreme Court decided to overturn abortion. And this landmark ruling making same-sex legal. Cities in America on edge as violence erupts among protesters. The latest sign that we may be headed for Protesters a recession. Protesters for racial justice continue. The fight against climate change. Unleashing a so Twitter barrage. They think they are falling behind. So are we on the verge of a coming storm? Because it seems that no matter where you look, there are increasing signs of turbulent days ahead. So what are some of the issues we're facing and how do we as the body of Christ navigate troubled seasons like this? Well, with the help of our special guests, we're gonna find out. But first, join me around the table and one of those guests, Lee Cummings, how are you? Doing great, thank you so much. You're in the state of Michigan? Yeah, People's You're gonna bring Republic. us up to date on what's happening there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so glad you're here. And Rebecca Lamb-Weiss. Happy to be here today. We're, I mean, we're gonna talk about some cutting edge stuff. Yeah, we need stuff to be Stuff you won't hear in the news. Yeah. But people can come to table talk and hear the truth. Exactly, and the church needs to understand her role and we are the yes. moral authority in the earth. So we need to stand up for what is right and be clear in our convictions. Preach and it, not girl. compromise. Preach it. That's my yes. daughter, folks, right there. And here's my other daughter, Rachel. Hello. Brown. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm excited about the show today. The Bible talks about how we are the salt and you light. You had this idea for this particular of show. Of the earth. This yes. is her brainchild. And as Christians, yes. we are <laughs> preserving a lost and dying world. And it's amazing to see pastors standing up and being bold and courageous mm -hmm. uh, against a culture mm -hmm. that is... Yeah. I can't even imagine. I can't even fathom the world that we're living in today yeah. and the things that we're having to, to deal with. I can't even imagine. Could you even imagine 10 years ago, Not Cindy Murdoch, even. that we would be having what we have right now? Not even. It's yeah. honestly, there are moments I just think I really cannot even believe what I'm seeing and hearing. Yes. It, it's just like a horror movie sometimes. It really is. And from representing Washington State folks, Russell Johnson, welcome. Hey, excited to be here. Thanks for having me, John. We have a lot of things to talk about. Yes, ma'am. Quite a bit. Yeah, okay. we're holding it together. So. And if, if, if that's not enough, we've got Jack Hibbs from California. Yes, California. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, which it is one of the most beautiful states. So uh, thank you for being here. And, and we're going to kind of talk about what's going on what we can do to get involved. Because, you know, with all the things we see happening around us, we're seeing a gathering storm on the horizon. And if so, what does this mean for America and how should the church be responding? I'll just tell you, Jack Hibbs, that there are people watching this show that they are not going to fall for it again. Because, right. you know, they're already talking about right. there's another uh, pandemic coming. Or they're going to, you know, we're going to have to wear a mask and we're going to shut down, et cetera, et cetera. I'm telling you, I think that people are gonna stand they up in are. a way that they never have before. Yeah. Do they need to? One thing is sure is that we have uh, lost faith in what is called the expert. We learned, That's we lost true. faith in that real quick. That's true. And so the thing is this, that um, yeah, there's another storm coming. There's always another storm coming. Yeah. But thank God for his word that prepares us for those storms that are arriving. We're ready. But uh, when it comes to masking up or whatever the next story is going to be to control, mm -hmm. um, I think people are, I would hope anyway, that people have had enough. Mm -hmm. And they have seen, they have discerned that uh, what was supposed to be so, uh, the science didn't uh, turn out to be Yeah, that. and you love science, right? I do. So forcing people to take some yeah, kind of you don't, yeah. vaccine that's not even been tested and has a controversial ingredients was insane, and now we have mm -hmm. people who are damaged for life because of taking yep. this vaccine. It seems to me, and I don't want to go hyper on this, but in a normal world, you would never subject a culture or a person, for that matter, to a, a, an experiment. But if we put everything together, the, the wokeness of the world, the vaccine craziness, the lockdowns, people losing freedoms, if you compile it all into a ball, Mm -hmm. It was this convergence of weird. Yeah. And people seemed, I don't know about you guys, or I think I can guess, we thought we knew some people. And when it hit, Ooh. Uh, we didn't know them. And so 
it has to have a profound spiritual yeah. foundation to it. Yeah. It's too big. It's too global. It's too quick. I think it's spiritually based. Russell, comment on what we are talking about right now. Are, are people going to stand up? Is the body of Christ going to stand up? Are we going to wake up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to if we're interested in, in being relevant for the next generation. You know, Paul tells Timothy, he says, the church is the pillar of truth mm -hmm. in society. And so I really feel like we have this, you know, epistemological responsibility to tell the truth. And if we can't tell the truth, then we've That's lost right. the only platform that matters. That's right. And, you know, we owe the culture an encounter with what is true. And uh, at the end of the day, the ultimate truth that we appeal to is Christ and his coming kingdom. And um, with all of the craziness of the world around us and it's coalescing again in, a, in, a, in another, you know, very vitriolic election season and, and so many comings and goings just kind of in our national media, it's never been more important for the church to find her prophetic voice. For when the church loses her voice, yes. the world loses its mind. That's true. And I, I just feel like there has never been a better opportunity because when the world is at its darkest, it gives the opportunity for the church to be at its brightest right yes. because it's a contrasting kingdom. So the kingdom of God is not a subculture to the political world. It is a counterculture. And so we have this ability to appeal to a higher truth, appeal to a higher allegiance, and in yes. doing so, I think, you know, uh, really, really serve as a prophetic witness in this hour that people ought to keep their eyes on Jesus because the things that we have put our faith in, our trust in, the shifting sands, when they are tested by the storm, what happens? Yeah. They get washed away. Yes. Yes. And the things we thought we knew, the people we thought mm -hmm. we knew, it's the true. things that we thought we could count on, the religious freedoms that we thought were just so apart and enshrined in our constitution that they could right. never be threatened. You know, we have realized over this last season that the things we have taken for granted, we should not have taken for granted. Yes. And this has been a wake-up call for the body of Christ. And if we don't wake up, mm -hmm. then we don't, we don't frankly, deserve to have relevant churches for the next generation. We have to wake up, tell the truth, and in doing so, compel people to fidelity in Christ Jesus. Well, Amen. you know, um, what surprised you the most in this 2020, 2021? I know for me, one of the things that really shocked me was just the lack of celebration over Roe v. Wade being overturned. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's true. That's right. It's I crazy. mean, no mention of it. it I mean, well-known pastors that right. would not step across the line yeah. and stand for uh, biblical values as it relates to the unborn. What, what surprised you the well, most? It's this capitulation to political correctness. You know, the reason why I originally got involved in the public policy and the political space for about a decade before I transitioned to full-time ministry was over the pro-life issue because I was, you know, convinced that it represented the greatest civil rights violation in my generation right. and that we needed people from, you know, every type of background, but especially in the church to give voice to these types of things. And, uh, you know, Roe v. Wade for me, when I found out that that was getting overturned, I'll never forget where I was. I'll never forget what it felt like that moment. And I mean, that Sunday was the most wildest Pentecostal charismatic <laughs> celebration. And I just naturally thought to myself, I'm going to go watch the live stream of all these other churches. We all going to be Everyone's celebrating. Gonna, yeah. And not only were folks not celebrating it. They were lamenting it. Mm. And I thought to myself, how far have we fallen? Right. So true. It reminded me of the letters Jesus writes to the churches in Revelation. You know, you have fallen from these things. You must return to your first yes. works and your first yes. truths. I mean, you have fallen away from your first love. And it's almost in this effort to be politically correct, thinking if we can just kind of manage the middle and just, you know, be just a really sensitive, neutral voice. I mean, the era of political and cultural neutrality is over. Right. There is a dividing line. And I believe that we're in a season of the winnowing fan by which God, by his spirit, is separating the wheat from the chaff and the yes. sheep from the goats. And I'm not saying that every church has to turn into, you know, a, a, a political factory with political action committees. But if your pastor can't form one meaningful, coherent statement it's about true. the value of life, find a new church. Amen. Yeah. Because we should have celebrated Roe v. Wade, and we're still yes. going to celebrate. And in yes. fact, on the one-year anniversary of overturning Roe v. Wade, our church attempted to take out a full-page ad in the Seattle Times celebrating it, and they refused to host it because they said it's too nuclear it's too nuclear but i thought to myself look I, at least we're going to go down swinging right because i'm gonna I celebrate like this thing that's right Amen. Amen. So Amen. Good. Amen. Did your church fight a bill in california over an abortion we did can yeah. you tell us about that uh the governor of california at the time jerry brown uh heard the supreme court decision regarding the hobby lobby case 
Mm. And the uh, uh, Attorney General of the State of California issued a letter. We all got it in California. And it said that uh, the governor and the Attorney General views the Supreme Court's decision uh, as being unconstitutional. And they overrode in California the U.S. Supreme Court. And they demanded that all churches in 501c3s pay for elective abortions that was in the Obama plan. Wow. And I immediately refused. So we lost our insurance coverage. Wow. And I filed a lawsuit against uh, the state of California. And that took about seven years, but we won. Wow. We won that case. Yay. And that is now set where 501c3s do not have to pay for elective abortions thank in their God. insurance plan. Well, thank God you were yes. willing to stand up. I mean, that yeah. is the thing. And I mean, lawsuits are, are not easy things. I mean, no. it, it, they can take years, like you said. Mm -hmm. So Lee Cummings, pastor there in Michigan, you have some interesting leadership there. Yes, our governor and our attorney general are adamantly pro-LGBTQ plus and ideology activists. And now they've controlled both houses of, of Congress as well as the governorship and the Supreme Court now. So we're in a really unique time and a really unique place in the state of Michigan. What in the world is going on that such a small segment of the American society can control so many things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is insane, isn't it? Yeah, but there was a guy by the name of Dr. James Dobson yes. sure. who, re who used to say, it's a slippery slope. If this starts to go a little bit, it's going to keep going. And the other team said, no, we just want to be recognized. That's yeah. it. That's all. And lo and behold, here we are. So a church should not test the wind to decide, well, do we do this or do, do that based upon what? How many likes we get? Right. I mean this with all due respect and affection. Life to me is rigged this way. Our God's sovereign. We're living this time thing out. And so back to the Bible, yeah. we'll experience a, an, a revival in the church if we do. And then the lost will have a place to go to because the church is alive and you'll see a great awakening among the well, lost. My grandpa That's used to say there's two ditches on either side of the road and the church oftentimes falls into one of those two ditches. We either want to affirm sin, or on the other hand, what we want to do is we want to turn them into enemies. Yeah. And yet here Ooh. we are as the church. We have the only good news. That's right. It's the That's gospel true. of right. Jesus Christ. And he saves to the uttermost. Amen. So we've got some people in the pulpit that won't preach truth whatsoever, and other people who are using it as a weapon right. to try to harm people. And that's not at all who we're supposed to be either. There's nobody more loving and gracious and saving than Jesus. Yeah, it's a balance. But, yeah. I mean, it really is that you've got to talk about repentance. You've got to talk about sin. At the same time, you've got to understand God's grace and his forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to have the whole counsel of yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. And Don't it's all know? in Jesus. He's all of those things. He's yeah. grace and truth. Yes. And so, yeah. you know, it all goes back to the cross. If Jesus didn't die for our sins, then the cross would have been the cruelest thing a father could do to his yes. son. It had to mean something. It had to have a purpose. Yeah. And so if we don't call sin what it is, then mm -hmm. we're taking away what Jesus did on the cross. So it's, yeah. but the love and the grace and the mercy mm -hmm. of God for us that he took our punishment and our sins mm -hmm. shows God's great love for all of us. So it's all in mm -hmm. the message of the cross. You can find the full answer there. You know, and people watching that don't have a relationship with God, I mean, it's really that simple to yes. just say, Jesus, I need you. That's what my grandpa prayed. Mm -hmm. He didn't he'd come from church. He knelt down at a tool and die mill in Greenville, South Carolina on a Monday morning mm -hmm. and said, God, if you're there, yeah. I need you. Mm -hmm. And God transformed his life and changed the trajectory of our family, married my grandmother, had seven kids, six girls and one boy. That boy would be my dad. And I'm here today as a testimony of that decision that he made. You can change the trajectory of your right, family right. by right. saying, Jesus, I need you. And it's just that simple. And so you can do that right there where you are. One of the things I know everyone's concerned about is what's going on with our children. Yes. Yeah, I mean, essentially the Washington State Legislature has interjected themselves into the familial unit and is standing now between parents and their children functioning as this kind of quasi layer of authority. You know, the, 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 the family is God's first ever governmental system. That's right. And when the family struggles, then the government of man has to continue to grow. And so the Washington State Legislature is interjecting themselves into these conversations and essentially has equated a parent who is unwilling to affirm the gender confusion of their minor child with 
child abuse. And so what it does is it kind of weaponizes and allows state employees to now function as that replacement parental unit and offer what the legislature calls gender affirming services, counsel, things of that nature. What we're seeing now on the back end is this has created a litigious environment where mm -hmm. parents are now suing school districts. Right. People who are detransitioning are suing doctors and they're saying, hey, we weren't fully informed. What are we even talking about? You know, in Washington state, you can't even go to a, a, um, a tanning salon if you're under 18. You can't get a tattoo. You can't get your ears pierced without parental mm -hmm. permission. Wow. But if you're 12 or 13 and you're having questions about gender and dysphoria and things of that nature, a, a, a public school employee or a government employee can interject themselves and become essentially your replacement parental unit. And so when we attack the family unit uh, and, and, and those types of things, I mean, it, it, it speaks something, you know, particularly negative about the trajectory of public policy. And like you mentioned with Dr. Dobson, you know, because I was a part of Dr. Dobson's rallies against same-sex marriage about 15 years ago. He's doing May Day for Marriage rallies May Day for around marriage. the nation. Oh, yes. And I remember him prophetically talking about this. He said, it doesn't stop here. That's right. And mm -hmm. if you think it does, you are operating in wow. an unintelligent way. And, you know, he kind of got roasted for that and, oh, come on, and you're just being draconian. If there is one thing that has been proved to be true as it pertains to this type of stuff for the last 10 to 15 years is that the slippery slope mm -hmm. absolutely exists yes. and we're sliding in the wrong direction faster than ever before. And so, you know, just two weeks ago, we launched Pursuit Elementary School. We're launching an elementary school at our church. Right on. We're bringing kids in. Why? Because we mm -hmm. want to give every parent the option yes. for Christian education yes. for their young person because here's the reality. If we can make a difference in the worldview right. of a first grader, second grader, third grader, fourth grader, you got to do a lot less cleanup when they're yes. 20, 30, 40 yep. years yes. old. Yeah. And so we really have taken this as a mandate and an opportunity to go, hey, there's awesome. a legislative piece that we're going to fight. Yep. There's an educational piece that we're going to incorporate. We're, we're going we're gonna to take this on as a multi approach and in doing so try to turn the tide and give parents the option That's to awesome. go hey we don't yes. we're, we're, we're not going to be a part of this system yep. so now where would that um where would the school be located is it the seattle area yeah it's in it's in our uh, snohomish location which is just north of seattle about 35 minutes and uh, you know our idea would be that we're, we're going to have elementary school presences at every one of the campuses we open because a lot yes. of the christian schools right now in washington state waiting list of hundreds right. of students mm -hmm. because parents are essentially saying we we're not doing this. Right. Well, you, you pointed out uh, you, you have to get permission to get your ears pierced or yeah. a tattoo. Yeah. Um, now, you have to think this through in a reverse way. Why, why do you have to do that? Well, because Satan, frankly, doesn't care. Uh, meaning you got to get permission to get your ears pierced, but you don't have to get permission to have an abortion and your parents won't know about it. I believe that when the church falls asleep or drops dead or whatever it's doing right now in America, then ancient strongholds re-establish themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the pagan world, it seems like it's coming back with the silence of the church. The church is to be the light. If we are not shining that light, then the darkness comes. What do we see? Darkness coming. Yes. And the fun thing about the states that you and I are serving in, by the way, the same laws, those same things going on in California. I actually think that there's spiritual powers behind people's totally, thinking. Absolutely. I mean, all you have to do is, is listen to Gavin Newsom, our governor, and see his way of thinking. He is attacking churches and Christian school teachers instead of fixing the fentanyl problem. He's absolutely doubling down yeah. on faith, and he's letting our freeways fall apart. That's why you know that there, there is a battle going on, good yes. against evil, and there are... There are spiritual yes. uh, entities that mm -hmm. are behind a lot of the stuff that we're seeing. You know, That's Lee, true. what about all of these kids that went through these painful surgeries and now five, six years later, they're coming out all over the internet yeah. saying, why did my parents, why did the doctor allow this to happen? Because now yeah. I realized that I was wrong. I was 13 years old. I was 14 years old. And now, you know, That's true. I mean, they're they're devastated. Yeah, and detransitioners. And if you look on social media, it's amazing how the people that are advocates for allowing minors to do this 
talk about, you have to let them do this. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have a, uh, a living child that transitions mm -hmm. and identifies differently? Or would you rather have your child dead because of suicide, because you don't allow them? Those same voices That's right. after the fact, when a child or a young adult wants to detransition, and make no mistake about it, the uh, American Psychiatric Association, when you look in their journals and in their research, the percentage of minors who go back to their birth gender before they're in their 20s is exceedingly high. It's like 75%. So you get these kids who have surgeries early on, then want to go back, and what happens is the very same community that says you have to affirm them begins to bully them mm -hmm. and persecute them and silence them yeah. and cancel them on social media they because they the highest, don't want that. They have the highest suicide Right. Yeah. The ones that go yeah. through the surgery. So our governor right now is, we have a bill called H.R. 4474 that basically is referred to as the pronoun bill. And basically what it says is that if somebody feels that your speech or the way that you communicate to them in a protected class of people, a uh, gender identity or a sexual orientation group of people that are a protected minority, that if they feel intimidated, if they feel terrorized by your words or your lack of words, they can actually sue you. And so it's $5,000 fine or five years, $10,000 fine and re-education camp. So basically if somebody says my pronouns are such and such and you choose not to use them and they feel, and here's the key word, feeling, everything is boiling down to feelings now. Wow. If they feel intimidated, yeah. terrorized or bullied by you and they're a protected class, you can now be sued and be forced to go through a re-education camp or pay a massive fine. So, That's just one of the things. So what happens then if we're preaching the gospel, if we're witnessing to someone, if you're, jo Joni, you're doing a program mm -hmm. and someone's convicted by the work of the Holy Spirit, they feel uncomfortable. I felt uncomfortable when she was telling me this, or you guys yeah. were preaching. I felt uncomfortable. It seems as though they're moving, try, they're trying to legislate against the work of the Holy Spirit yeah. because the truth stings at first. Yes. And then you process that. Yeah, and how, and how do you measure feelings? Feelings are the most unscientific thing that there is. So on one hand, we're said, listen to the science. And then when you pull out and say biology is science and biology says this, well, now don't listen to the science. And then when it comes down to your well, feelings, yep. how do you, what's the metric for feelings? And a big movement within the public school system is, I don't know what the term is, but they early on ask children, have you ever thought, have you ever had the thought in your mind, what it would be like to kiss a girl or to kiss yeah. a boy? Well, then you, you, may, you may be gay. Mm -hmm. They put that in there. A little, kid is, right. a little kid is fashionable, a little kid yeah. is moldable, pliable, yeah. and they, they put that in there. Evil. Yeah. And then, exactly, they preset. Yeah. So they're the ones actually, I believe, doing the basically sexual mental abuse. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, Russell AI. Oh, boy. It's going to change the entire job market, I think, in the next 10 to 20 years. It's the revolution in technology. You know, I look at technology as um, a amoral, not, not, not intrinsically moral right. or intrinsically immoral, but it takes on the morality of the user. That's right. And so how can we utilize this and leverage it to advance the kingdom, yeah. but at the same time not mm -hmm. lose the human interactive part of what it means to be a minister, what it means to be a shepherd, right. what it means to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, the ministry of the kingdom is incarnational by nature. It's not just that Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. It's that we are flesh and we are dwelling amongst people in this world. It's not just a live stream. It's not just on a screen. It's not just over the internet. The ministry portion of this is interactive. We're working with people. We're hearing them out. Lay hands on the sick. It's a lot of this interactive type stuff. And at the end of the day, it cannot become the substitute for a real encounter with God and an incarnational encounter with others. So yeah. good, Jack. Amen. So Congress just uh, commenced, uh, and they're going to do more of these uh, congressional hearings on APUs or otherwise known as UFOs, and they're incorporating now in their discussion AI. And there's a lot of debate among these people about what could this possibly mean? Is the timing uh, right? Well, what's interesting to me is when you guys, I don't know if you saw this or not, the church in Germany, did you see the church in Germany yeah. who had an AI church service? Yeah. Yeah. It was the yeah. first time that that church was filled in over 60 years. People stood in line for three hours to get into a church wow. cathedral in Germany to see an AI 
sermon delivered. People coming out were interviewed. You can watch it on YouTube. And they were asked, what was your experience? They said it was very fascinating. It's kind of exciting. However, it was extremely impersonal. It was obvious that I'm not talking to something that is real. And it caused me to think this thought. Revelation 13, he performs uh, signs so that he makes fire to come down from heaven and earth in the, in the sight of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs in which was granted him to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And it was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who did not worship the image of the beast to be killed. What if Paul was correct in the book of Corinthians and says when you bow down to idols, you're bowing down to demons. Mm -hmm. What if a demon possessed mm -hmm. an AI device? Mm -hmm. What if the idols of the old, we create an idol today? Man is making a God in his own image. That's what AI is doing. Joni, what's really interesting is Romans chapter one uh, and is all mm. about an inflection point in a society. And I think that's where America is at right now. We're at an inflection point. Romans one is all about an exchange. We exchange God for idols. Yep. We exchange mm -hmm. truth for a lie. And then ultimately we exchange even basic natural things like sexuality for a counterfeit version of that. Mm -hmm. And when you see a society that's at that inflection point, we can look at these things. We know from the book of Daniel, knowledge is gonna increase. Mm -hmm. We're the first generation literally alive on the planet that has seen the reverse of the effects of Babel thousands of years ago. We're right. actually the only generation that's ever seen that. And so many people are fearful of that. They're just like looking at AI and they're looking at what's going on. And yeah. I pastor thousands of people and they'll say, Pastor, you know, what should we do? It's like, lift up your head. Amen. Because when we begin to see these things take place, it's an acceleration towards something. Yeah. Right. And this is not like God's out of control. God is going to, if, if AI is going to be a dominant part of our culture in the future, the thing that it can't reproduce is the anointing. Mm -hmm. that every That's believer true. carries. And it's okay. an opportunity right. for the church right now to kind of lift up our heads, lift up our perspective and our viewpoint yes. and say, yeah, we see darkness is on the rise, but you know what? The church is on the rise. And this so, is an opportunity for yeah. us. That's to right. Up. And God has allowed us to live here in this season for this time. Yes. And, um, you know, we've got to be found faithful and we can operate in fear. That's so, so very important. But we're out of time. We could keep talking forever with these guys. <laughs> so Will y'all come back and we continue yeah. awesome. with some more Love stuff? We are out of time, but I want you to remember that no matter what we see going on around us, the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear. And I'm glad you ended on that, Lee. It's so important. So you don't need to be afraid. He is on the throne. I heard sometimes he hasn't fallen off the throne. If you're watching today and you want to have more boldness to stand for truth in these troubled times, or, or maybe you are dealing with fear, that's why that prayer line number is on the screen. We have amazing prayer partners standing by uh, to pray with you, encourage you. If you prayed the prayer earlier, invited Jesus into your heart, uh, we'd love to send you a free book called Now What? And uh, hey, this is a great new beginning for you and not a better time to come in yeah. than right now into the light of his love and know that Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll go with you to the end of the world. Yes. That's a pretty great promise. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, guys, for being here. Let us know how today's Table Talk touched your life. Leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. We love hearing from you. Thanks so much for watching. Be encouraged today. We share these things, but we want you to know that God is still in control. And really, our best days are ahead. We do believe the end time harvest. We do believe there is an awakening coming. And it's an opportunity for God to use you in your workplace, in your home. I mean, with your family, people that you haven't talked to about Jesus, they're just waiting for you to stand up and say, you know what, I am going to be obedient today and talk to this person about the Lord. Do that today. Be found faithful. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye for today.